So the early church, as you may or may not know, was uh, heavily dominated by men. Um, the 12 named apostles were obviously men, um, but there were many disciples and not all of those were men. And there's like specifics of Jesus and certain women. There are other uh, leaders of churches and pres presbyteresses in the early, uh, in you know, within the Bible. There are leaders of churches, there are teachers, there are prophetesses. So, um, right, so we have that. The early church is very male-centric and that reflected the andocentric Greco-Roman culture in which our faith uh, developed. But it's not the case that, that females are absent altogether, as I've just referenced, from the early church history period. And um, although it was min like minimal involvement, um, we can have a look at that at that that critiques really the idea that it was wholly patriarchal. So in martyrdom literature, particularly um, the female Christian voice and indeed the, the Christian female martyr is, um, is more heavily present. So from 112 uh, CE to 313, as you may or may not know, uh, sorry, fairly commonplace persecution, which is nothing new if you uh, follow what I'm talking about all the time and also martyrdom of Christians who refuse to either renounce their faith or um, give worship to um, the, the multitude, the, the pantheon of gods that were present within the Roman Empire. And um, other Christians who observed these uh, public spectacles, because they weren't privately uh, martyred, they were publicly murdered, um, recorded the event as a way of remembering them and inspiring faith and endurance in other people who would face the same um, ordeal or at least persecution or discrimination of some kind. So these were the most popular early Christian writings and they are, I read, instilled with rich theology on the nature of discipleship and the kingdom of God, which is obviously not gender centric. So women playing um, playing and played a certain role in these stories. So of the numerous examples, um, like I said, we're going to speak about two, which is, which are Perpetua and Blandina. So Blandina was one of the uh, Gallican Christians and she was martyred in 177 CE. Um, and the account of her martyrdom is preserved by church historian Eusebius of Caesarea. And the other lady is Vibia Perpetua, who was martyred along with several others in Carthage, which is northern Africa, at the beginning of the third century. And um, yeah, the bulk of her story comes from her journals, Perpetua's journal, uh, making it the earliest Christian document written by a woman. So in the narratives, both women are leaders among the martyrs, not, not necessarily among their, their churches, but among the martyrs. Blandina um, constantly is looked to as a source of inspiration by Christians undergoing torture at that time. Um, and in one place, her direct encouragement to a young man in his hour of weakness allowed him to remain steadfast until the end. Likewise, uh, in her imprisonment, Perpetua is given um, by the Lord a series of visions uh, and then she then shares them to encourage perseverance among other persecuted Christians and notably respective groups um, including among the Gallican Christians Bishop uh, Pothinus is what I read. So both of their stories also portray the women in ways that were scandalous to the uh, norms of the particular time and the societies within which they were. Um, where women were defined by having worth only through their relationship to men, basically, as daughters, wives, mothers, etc. Perpetua uh, is first introduced in her roles as a mother. Uh, she has an infant son. And um, as a daughter, she is visited by her father whilst in prison. However, she refuses to listen to her father when he begs her to um, like give up this nonsense, basically. Um, and to deny Christ in order to save her like physical life and to be able to raise her son. And instead what she does is she gives her child up to the care of her father rather than denounce or deny Christ. Um, so she, she renounces pretty much both of her roles, mother and uh, daughter at that point, which is 
in keeping with what the Bible teaches anyway. So, but, um, like, her father doesn't condemn her for this decision um, that we know of, and the narrative certainly doesn't, um, and praises the action as one of, uh, I read here, paradigmatic discipleship. And Blandina, who has no affiliation to a man, is described as a noble mother who had comforted her children and sent them on triumphantly to the king, and that's in Church History 5.1.55. Um, but her children are not biological children, uh, but rather that's referring to her fellow martyrs who looked to her for strength and found it, uh, incidentally. So lastly, both stories, um, in both of their stories, the women are uh, featured as the martyrs in whom Christ is most present. So they're extolled as um, like epitomizing um, feminine martyrdom, at least, or Christian martyrdom. Um, like Stephen, who in the New Testament is the first Christian martyr, both women become uh, figures representative of Christ. So in during her torture, Perpetua is um, thinking not of herself, similar to Christ, um, but is encouraging and sustaining and lifting up other Christians before being pierced in the side, which as anybody who knows anything about the crucifixion, lions, I said... <laughs> Blandina uh, was hung on a stake to make her easier for the lions in case they were having a bad day. That's not why. Um, just to be spiteful, really, I guess, and, and cruel. But the image, uh, like the, you know, that's evocative of Christ hanging on the cross. And um, it's quoted that she appeared to be hanging in the shape of a cross and her constant prayers greatly inspired her fellow victims who saw the one with a capital O who was crucified in the form of their sister and that's church history 5.1 um, you know a strong female voice I'm not a feminist by the way but a strong feminine voice is heard um, which could easily have been overlooked or you know pushed to the back but like I said earlier um, female Christian martyrs of this era at least were very popular um, you know, recountings of their stories were very popular uh, within the Christian community. And Christ proved that what men think lowly God deems worthy of great glory, not lowly God, that should be a comma there. Christ proved that what men think lowly, God deems worthy of great glory. And that's Church History 5.1.17. So the irony um, of these accounts, at a time when the church had already identified, or at least um, it can be interpreted as identifying um, masculinity or maleness, actually, um, as an essential quality for Christian leadership, i.e. First Timothy, uh, the Romans did not distinguish whatsoever, and pretty much similar to today, just saying I am a Christian, um, still in some places in the world is illegal, or is worthy of a death sentence, and the Romans were forerunners <laughs> in this um, persecution, which is foretold by Christ, to be fair. So they didn't distinguish uh, maleness as anything essential to being a Christian leader. Um, and killed, they tortured and killed Christians regardless. They were pretty equal opportunities murderers uh, in that respect. So all that mattered to them was, you know, a verbal confession. I am a Christian or I do follow Christ. And... Um, the same can be said for the martyrs who were visited by Christ through women. So it says in those moments, the gentle martyrs were sustained by their ministry. Uh, so the female voice in the patristic age is preserved in the martyrdom literature then, like I say, very popular. Um, like the implications for this are, um, it's a unique genre. Uh, it says we do not read treatises regarding the nature of God or humanity or the church from a human perspective Rather, we encounter the lives of true disciples, those who have conformed themselves to Christ, even in death, their own death, rather than the generalized Christian, you know, uh, being in death with Christ, who live in Christ, uh, which ultimately demonstrates the startling nature of the kingdom of God, because, of course, people don't happily go to their deaths for things they believe are nonsense. Um, and in these stories, we see... Um, like basically the mould being broken or at least patriarchal, you know, cultural, uh, normative, I don't know, like gender identities. It all sounds very microaggression to me when I speak like this. But 
it reveals the liberation that Christ brings, not only from, uh, you know, like neither male or female, Jew or Gentile, but also, you know, the truth will set you free and free indeed. And um, Christian is the penalty of sin. And indeed, you're given some um, some massive help towards avoiding sin in the first place um, through the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit. So, yeah, Jesus is liberating message with which, at least in regard to women, was obscured in uh, in the early church because I don't know why. I mean, the story of Mary and Martha is still included, but I don't think that the I think when, um, you know, uh, Jews would read these stories, if they read the New Testament in those times, they would recognize that to sit at the feet of a rabbi for a woman was pretty radical. And yet Jesus is clearly saying, no, leave her where she is, um, you know, like so she can continue to learn. And, and, and of course, Mary was treated um, as a disciple. Yeah, she, she wasn't uh, just out making the sandwiches kind of thing. So where was I? Right. Um, it says the powerful ministry of Blandina and Perpetua and countless other mothers named and unnamed shows us that where the kingdom of God is, there is no longer Jew or Greek. Uh, there is no longer slave. Sorry, that's Galatians 3.28. What I'd like to add is that's not a pro-transgender uh, verse. <laughs> um, and certainly uh, Deuteronomy, I think 23.1 is uh, like anti. But What's happening is, I mean, obviously, there is no longer male, there is no longer slave or free. We'll take that as an example. I'm going off topic slightly, but there certainly still were slaves and free people, uh, free men. But Christians were um, commanded to treat their servants or slaves um, differently, basically, that if they were both Christian, they were, you know, the, like treat them as a brother, basically. Not this kind of brother that you pay for all their food and leave them in their room, like work. No, they're still your employee or your servant or your slave. But, you know, there are other parts in the Bible that say treat them uh, accordingly. And after a certain amount of years, uh, give them their freedom. So it's not act, it's not like slavery as in you're a chattel and, and therefore that's you finished. So I finished that. So I'm going to look quickly at the um, chat, which probably won't show up. Uh, once this is published, there are still men and women too, <laughs> yes, <laughs> hallelujah, because, oh, well, yeah, so, yeah, villainous, sorry, I started it, and then it was a black screen, I had to start it again, sorry, so, right, any questions, any, I say this at the end of every lecture, and I'm pretty certain I know the answer but you just have to type now people you don't really have to speak you can't speak it doesn't matter if you share your screen so Cherokee I took most of that from a link that you sent me from somebody who's a oh, I think a favorite writer of yours no okay what I'll do is give you the opportunity to bring up a quick topic that I'll just chit chat on for five minutes and then I'll end and I'll come back to Discord. By the way, Discord. So Discord, I do lectures um, Mondays to Fridays. Fridays are women only. Doesn't matter if you put on a squeaky voice. It's women only, born a woman only, women only, people with ovaries, women, you know the ones, uh, not men. Uh, but Monday, Wednesday, if I could reconnect to the internet, is polemics. Thursday's church history, i.e. today slash miscellaneous but we won't get into that because i have hopes one day that we'll have finished the church history even though it's a massive massive area so did i discuss the wealthy women supporting christ's ministry no villainous what i mentioned is perpetua and blandina so only two women uh, neither of them uh, mentioned in the bible so it's early church history and uh, women's studies I guess or anyone could be interested in them so just two of these ladies they were both martyrs and it wasn't even their stories to be fair it was like a, a commentary or like just a, a cobbling together of stuff about both of them but what I will attempt to do because Perpetua wrote uh, a journal while she was imprisoned and Blandina I think uh, somebody else obviously um, 
like noted it all down what I'll try to do is get the links and shove them in the description box um, afterwards so let me press the button again because it always disappears and Cherokee I'm gonna have to repeat it now she says that all are equal at the foot of the cross and then it's a massive hallelujah from Cherokee three whole exclamation points I want to hammer that home because as we know Terry Pratchett says that multiple uh, punctuation is the sure sign of an insane mind <laughs> but I mean that's just his opinion and he has passed away so he can't take it back but he was very humorous right so on that bombshell discord link will be in the live chat if um, anyone feels um, capable or, or willing to do that for me it will also should be in the link of this um, because the live chat doesn't come up I read that Christ gave the example at the woman at the well of the woman at the well of the mm, I don't, villainous <laughs> I'm not sure yeah at the at the well that woman was um, a Sumerian I believe and uh, she so she was even more um, not part of the fold I don't mean Jesus's fold by the way I mean like as a colloquialism she you, you know she was outside of Israel as it were not the place the bloodline and therefore, you know, uh, was shunned. Uh, and he gave her news that nobody else really had publicly. He'd done a miracle by then, uh, the water into the wine. So he was becoming known. He'd been accused of a couple of things, but he, he told her who he was quite clear. Well, clearly for him, like plainly as in, you know, he's the living water and anyone who drinks of that water will not thirst. So that's good. Yeah, he had nothing against women um, at all actually so and um oh just love him right any final comments before i just come back to discord no so anyone who doesn't know round about this time every evening you will hear me twittering on on discord and eventually people join in and uh and we have a little chat sometimes we even have a laugh but cherokee says hold up the first female eva woman, sorry, evangelist who ran to her village and took the good news to the Messiah. Yes, to that the Messiah had come. Yes, that's her. C couldn't miss her screeching, <laughs> running around for villainous this morning. You've always got a pedant. There's always a pedant somewhere in Australia, it seems. Right, so, save me someone. Either, uh, oh, while I'm at it, while I'm at it, so Discord link. I've got nothing, oh my gosh, right, so what's the, parlour's gone, so don't worry about that, Patreon's still there, what else, there's something or other I can't remember, eh, it will be in the description box if I remember it, please do come to Discord, um, and yeah, oh, and go and subscribe, oh, subscribe, like, comment, pray, repent, um, get on your knees, you know, the, you know, ask Jesus into your life, What's the worst that can happen? Rumble. Thank you, Cherokee. Oh, she's such a good girl. Okay. Bombshell's over. I'm going to stop this stream because I, I can't end phone calls either. It's just one of those things I say bye-bye about 18 times. But I'm being stern and I'm going to do it. And subscribe to Soko Studio as well and Soko Films. Big up, JC, because I love that dude. The, uh, the South American one. I also love the big JC, that dude. Oh. He, he should be bigged up. All right. God bless you. And uh, bye. In the Discord lecture room, as it were. And hopefully they realise that this is a uh, successful stream, unlike yesterday's first efforts. While I'm waiting, um, I'll let you know that this is just a recorded Discord lecture. So I don't mean pre-recorded. I mean, I'm just recording it as I would um, without my camera in the audio in the soco discord server and the link to that server will be in the description box once the video is published so not whilst it's going on now i don't know actually hey right so um the topic for today because generally on fridays we have women's only um attendees but we have decided hello everybody god bless you um yeah that we're gonna just go for it and um, more people will be able to hear about early Christian women, and I don't mean in the morning, I mean women at the beginning when Christianity was being formed, and I'm just going to start reading, basically, hello, ah, Robert, hi, hi, 
Right, so it says, I better get back to the beginning. How organized of me. Oh my gosh, I was scanning for SJW, like trigger words. <laughs> so anyway, let's get uh, whatever. If I accidentally say patriarchy, please do forgive me. So here we go. And this is 10 um, should be famous women from early Christianity. And this is an article which I will link in the description box. But at the moment, I can't see the top of the screen, so I don't know. So women feature prominently in the Gospels and Book of Acts um, in the New Testament as supporters of Jesus's ministry. The most famous of these is Mary Magdalene, who I'm sure you'll, heard, you'll have heard of. Hello, Lion of Christ. Right, most likely an upper class woman of means instead of the prostitute label still wrongly attached to her. But there's also Mary and Martha, who, as uh, any Christians watching will know, should know, are the sisters of Lazarus. And I mentioned um, them yesterday in reference to uh, when we were talking about Blandina and can't remember Perpetua and the fact that uh, Christ allowed one of them to sit at his feet whilst he was a rabbi, which was out of like the societal norms. I'm going to stop adding side notes. Never going to happen. But here we go. And many others who are referenced warmly in the epistles, even when women in general um, are referenced as kind of second class. So the first people recorded as seeing uh, the resurrected Christ were women, as hopefully everybody already knows. And women are integral to the first Christian community as depicted in the book of Acts. Christ himself has nothing to say about equality because I, you know, I think it's a presumption of his that men and women are equally bad, <laughs> basically. Um, so there's no superiority in, uh, in as far as gender or sexes, rather. He seems throughout the Gospels, it says here, to take as self-evident that there's nothing inherently superior in either. And St. Paul, or Paul, as I call him, um, those and other writers and Paul um, basically introduced the, um, the, the sort of hierarchical, uh, as it were. I mean, Christ did, yeah, reference to uh, man, sorry, husband being the head of the wife and Christ being the head of the husband, I don't believe is um, saying that there's any superiority at all and I can come to that um, either later or another time so yeah um, basically Eve was linked to the fall of man directly and I think therein crept in apart from the societies around the Israelites and uh, you know everybody else of that time women weren't exactly top of the pecking order I'm gonna stop waffling any time now right so proba here we go right I'll hold on right stop Eve as Paul writes, was deceived and then tempted um, Adam to sin. Left to his own devices, I read here, the implication is that Adam would have remained happily in the garden and uh, so would all his and Eve's descendants. Women, therefore, are not to be trusted, apparently, and could not hold authority over men and should learn from men in silence. <laughs> Sorry. Lest they tempt Adam's descendants further. I mean, further from fallen, I don't know, you know, but first Timothy 2, 11 to 14, if anyone wants to get on that bandwagon. Um, even so, Paul himself seems to echo Christ's own view of the equality of the sexes when he writes, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, i.e. slave or free man. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Sorry, it cut out. The many other passages from the New Testament supporting male superiority, I'm afraid, were and still are quoted far more often then the line from Galatians um, that I just read, and women are still denied leadership positions in a number of Christian denominations and sects. I actually have personal views of that, but we won't go into that. So this was not always so. And there were many women in the early church who held positions of authority, established religious orders, and wrote influential theological works prior to the suppression often of those, uh, those works. So anyone with even a cursory knowledge of Christianity has heard the term church fathers, but much, much, much less so, because it sounds kind of made up, um, is church mothers. And yet in the early days of Christianity, women were at the forefront of the religion. And I know that in um, derogatory remarks, like it's, you know, they were accused of uh, being a religion just for women and children and basically idiots. 
So Roman women were the first to take Christianity seriously, and there are many stories preserved in the writings of the Church Fathers and in the Tales of the Martyrs, which is uh, what we started on yesterday, of strong women converting their households uh, to the new faith. Some of these early church mothers embraced Christianity so completely that they gave away whatever they had, often substantial sums of money, large estates, to help the poor, the sick and the needy in compliance with Jesus' directive that inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And that's in Matthew 25, 40. It's not feminism. I'm not a feminist, but thanks for the comment. Okay, service to others, especially to those in need, um, was service to Christ himself. And a number of these women came to be known as desert mothers, founders of monastic orders in the deserts of Egypt, Syria, Persia, and Asia Minor, known as Ummas, uh, or mothers. They were the female counterpart to the better known Abbas, i.e. fathers, such as, I read here, Antony the Great, also known as Saint Antony of Egypt, 251 to 356 uh, CE who was credited with establishing Christian monasticism. Other women were famous writers who blended pre-Christian literature, i.e., I'm guessing, uh, Judeo, like Jewish literature, the Bible, and philosophy with biblical efforts, while also supporting men whose contributions today are more well known. So, any student of the Bible knows that St. Jerome, uh, and his dates are 347 to 420 CE, translated the work from Hebrew and Greek to Latin, creating the Vulgate translation, which would be used by the church for well over a thousand years. Few people, however, know that the idea for that translation came from a woman named Paula, who not only inspired the work, but proofread and edited it for publication. So women's role, therefore, in the church remained more or less the same, even after Christianity was elevated by Constantine the Great, uh, between 272 and 337 was his life, in 313 CE through his Edict of Milan, which proclaimed tolerance for the faith. So as many of you hopefully will know, Christianity is um, has a long history of uh, being persecuted. It's not only today in Nigeria and Pakistan and all of those uh, places. It was the first couple of centuries after its inception, as it were, it was um, a death sentence. So Constantine called the council at his villa at Nicaea to standardise Christian belief and practice, I read here. That's not quite um, accurate. The most important issue, um, the most important issues um, were like prophethood. I, I don't agree with this. Um, it says there were many other aspects of Christianity which were not uniform at the time, as we know, because Paul writes separate instructions to separate churches and they had different uh, poor behaviours that were going on. And so there were many uh, different ways of practising the central religious concept of one true God redeeming the world. And there's a lovely picture of Nicaea, which I think I've got a link to. Um, okay, so whilst uh, this standardising process was going on, or, or you know, whilst they were um, getting their acts together, as it were, in acts as well, Constantine also wanted religious practice to reflect some uniformity, and Pope Clement I agreed that only men could serve as priests or hold authority in the church because Christ had chosen only males as his apostles. <laughs> but the disciples, as we know, were many. The ecclesiastical writer Eusebius, 263 to 339 CE, records that the council, following Clement's lead and most likely influenced by Paul's admonitions on female inferiority, that over men. And by the time of the Council of Nicaea, however, many women had already proven themselves capable and inspiring religious leaders, and many more would prove so going forward. So these are now a list of 10 women who should be famous, but they're not. So, or some of them maybe. Right, the 10 women listed here are chosen from either end of the spectrum. So some of the names will be familiar to you and uh, some will be not like never heard of. So there are a very small sample of many women who contributed to the development of early Christianity and uh, we can go on to look at it in a more detail another time. So this, this is just a list now. Thecla, the Apostle. Perpetua, the Martyr. I'm so sorry for my pronunciation before it happens. Amma Syncletica of Alexandria. Saint Marcella. Macrina the Younger. 
Proba, St. Paula, Melania the Elder, uh, Eudocia, and Egeria. Um, she's pretty late, actually, Egeria. Not only in the list. Okay, so Thecla, first century. So the same uh, century that Christ was uh, born, died, resurrected, and ascended in, is known for the apocryphal work, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which narrates her conversion to Christianity by St. Paul and her subsequent travels with him divine rescue from various persecutions and death, and career as a healer, preacher, and inspiring religious leader. Thecla's story has been regularly dismissed in the past as Christian fiction, but modern scholars believe that though there is no doubt some exaggeration of events, um, the account is based on an actual woman. In his epistles, Paul regularly mentions women who have helped him, and Thecla's story is not so very different from many others save for the repeated miraculous rescues from death. One aspect of her story, known to be true, of women of her time is her vow of chastity, which she kept from her conversion up until the end of her life. Women choosing a chaste life, even if they were married, was a dramatic statement of individuality in claiming rights over their own bodies and, by extension, over the direction of their lives. And we read yesterday about Perpetua, who gave up her, her position as uh, mother and daughter. So, um, Perpetua, again from yesterday, 181 to 203. She's famous as an early Christian martyr, who scholar I am Plant notes that in nearly every case, stories of Christian martyrs um, have been fictionalised and or are fictional. But the martyrdom of Perpetua, however, is generally taken to be exceptional to this rule. A citizen of Carthage, Perpetua was arrested during a persecution of Christians under the Roman Emperor Septimus Severus, sounds like a Harry Potter character, who lived in 202 to, uh, sorry, yeah, who, who was born in 202 to 203 CE, because I was thinking that's a short life. She was 22 at the time and nursing her newborn, oh, when she was taken to prison. Her father and renounced her faith but she refused and was executed along with her servant. Based on details of the original narrative concerning motherhood, scholars believe that her diaries basically were written by a woman, i.e. her, the early part by her, and um, obviously the account of the death would have been added, I guess, by somebody else. So Amma Syncletica of Alexandria, she's third century, at least her birth is in 270, and she died circa 350. Um, and she's one of the best known desert mothers, and I'm embarrassed to say I've never heard of her, and an early founder of the monastic tradition. Syncletica was the daughter of wealthy parents in Alexandria, Egypt, whose beauty attracted many suitors. She refused them all, however, due to her devotion to Christ. And after her parents' death, she cut her hair, gave her inheritance to the poor, and left the city with her younger sister, who was blind, to live a life of chastity, poverty, and solitude near the crypt of a relative and in solitude she is said to have wrestled with demons who tried to convince her to resume her previous life of wealth and pleasure but she remained faithful having attained the enlightenment and closeness to god that she sought she consented to teach others who sought her out and provided guidelines for this early monastic order of women these rules recorded by a bio biographer possibly Athanasius, uh, the Bishop of Alexandria, would later influence European monasticism. Hi, Peter. Right, Saint Marcella was a wealthy Roman Christian woman who, after her husband's death, devoted herself to her faith through a life of chastity. Again, it's pretty popular at the time. And, well, it also is now in convents. And fasting and mortification of the flesh. She was a friend of the future St. Paula and correspondent with uh, St. Jerome. Marcella, formerly one of the wealthiest women in the city, gave away or sold her worldly goods, including all of her clothes, I'm sure she wasn't walking around naked by the way, jewellery and expensive cosmetics to benefit the poor and live free of possessions in communion with Christ. Like many early Christian women, she reclaimed her identity through chastity, refusing to marry, or sorry, remarry, even though the law dictated that she should, and dedicated herself to her improvised monastic order, which would inspire other women to follow her lead. She died in the Visigoth sack of Rome in 410 CE. Okay, so now we're on to Macrina the Younger, who, um, I don't know if she had an older sister, like just 
Anyway, 330 to 379 CE. She was a Christian ascetic whose devotion to God inspired the work and life of her far more famous younger brothers, St. Basil the Great and St. Gregory of Nyssa. And uh, they were both born in, uh, well, 329 and 335 respectively. Macrina, like many of the others in this list, was born to wealthy parents in Anatolia, modern day Turkey, and arranged to marry well. When her fiance died, she refused to marry anybody else and chose a life of chastity and prayer, claiming that Christ was her bridegroom and she needed no other. So that's reminiscent of today's uh, convent practice. Macrina practiced a rigid asceticism and devoted herself to the education of others, especially her younger brothers, who obviously went on <laughs> to claim a little bit more fame than she. And after her father's death, she and her mother moved to an estate on the river Iris in Pontus, where she established a Christian community devoted to perfecting their relationship with God and was frequently consulted by pilgrims who came to seek her counsel. So not like a second class citizen, just someone, you know, sweeping up at the end of the service. Proba, 322 to 370, holds the distinction as the first female Christian writer solidly attested by documentation. She is known for the genre of literary work called a cento or patchwork, in which an author used lines from established poetic works woven with their own to create a completely new work of art. In the present day, this would be sampling a Roman family and was most likely raised in Roman pagan tradition before converting to Christianity some time before embarking on her literary career. She combined the poetry of Virgil with biblical themes to emphasize the eternal and heroic aspects of Christianity. Her works were later used in Roman classrooms to teach upper class children as they subtly combined the pagan history of the past with Christian ideals. And now we're on to St. Paula, uh, 347 to 404 CE. Um, Paula was the close associate of St. Jerome, who encouraged him to translate the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin and thereby creating the Vulgate translation, which um, was in use for 1500 years as the authoritative scripture of Christianity. So pretty big contribution. Uh, Paula was another wealthy Roman aristocrat who, after the death of her husband, was drawn to the monastic community of women established by Marcella on the Aventine Hill. She became acquainted with St. Jerome through Marcella and travelled widely with him, so uh, not a weak and feeble woman, it seems, establishing a religious centre in Bethlehem and practising strict asceticism, including abstinence. She helped Jerome translate the Bible, proofread his work and edited it for publication. When she died, her passing was deeply mourned by the Christian community and she was uh, sainted, it says, within a year. I think that should say canonised, but I don't know. Okay, and on we go. Melania, um, not Trump. This is Melania the Elder, quite a bit older than uh, the former First Lady because she's born in 350 to 410 CE. And she was a desert mother honoured for her devotion to God and support of Christian orders. She was a member of one of the wealthiest families in Roman Hispania, who moved with her proconsul husband and family back to Rome only to watch all but one son die of the plague. That's a shame. After losing her family, she converted to Christianity and renounced the world, travelling to Egypt to live in a monastery. Unlike other Christian converts, Melania did not give away her worldly goods and used her substantial wealth to support Christian communities and initiatives. Yay! When the monks of her order were exiled to Palestine, she went with them and supported them until they could return. She founded two monastic orders in Jerusalem which and devotion to solitary prayer. Eudocia, 400 to 460, was one of the most prolific writers of her time who created numerous works on Christian themes which, like Proba's work, drew on pre-Christian literature. She was born in Athens and named Athenaeus, before converting to Christianity around the age of 20 and taking the name Aelia Eudocia following her baptism. Her works were quite popular and ranged from a cento drawing on Homer to poetry about her husband's life and military victories to saints' lives and church history. She is probably best known for her work, The Martyrdom, I'll get, I'll get that right, The Martyrdom 
of St. Cyprian, which tells the story of the chaste Christian Justa, the attempts by the pagan sage Cyprian to seduce her, his conversion to Christianity and martyrdom for his faith. So he just got the hat trick, it seems. And then Ageria. So this is last in the list. And her work is available, her original, well, not original, her transcribed writings are available, as I think are most of the other things referenced. So she's also known as Etheria, and she's circa the 380s, and that decade is when she was born. She was a Christian traveller and writer, known only from her work Itinerarium, also known as the Itinerarium Ageriae, or Travels of Ageria. And based on the text, which is pretty interesting because it describes the world as it was, apart from her, like, pre, you know, the things she assumed everybody knew, apart from that, it's a, a pretty decent snapshot. And she, because she was travelling, obviously, she described things that she saw. She was a woman of the upper class who went on pilgrimage to significant sites mentioned in the Bible. And she travelled through the regions of modern-day Turkey, Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and back to the region of Anatolia. So not a weekend away, in other words. Her work was a popular in, was popular enough to be copied um, and is recognised in the modern day as completely unique for its time, as it is a deeply personal account of Egeria's travels whilst also providing insight into the condition of the sites she visited. Um, travel at the time and since it's written in Latin. The contributions of these women were recognised by their male contemporaries who included accounts of their lives in their works on male saints. Amma Sincletica was so highly regarded she was given her own biography and Saint Jerome praised Paula in his works. The works of Proba and Eudocia seem to have been widely read, judging from copies, and even though Egeria's work was not discovered until the 19th century, it was recognised then as appearing in ex excerpt forms in other works from shortly after her time. So, uh, like, well, no, um, you know, our, our lesser known is debated by various scholars. Um, and the answer, it says here, uh, depends often on the political, religious or gender values of the writer who is making the claim. And that's not really a, a spoiler alert. In almost every case, the arguments in these debates say far more about the modern day writer they, than they do the subject at hand. Um, however, I'm told, scholar Laura Swan sums up the situation succinctly by writing, women's history has often been relegated to the shadows, felt but not seen. Many of our church fathers became prominent because of women. Many of these fathers were educated and supported by women and some are even credited with founding movements that were actually begun by the women in their lives. So as the church developed from its legitimization by Constantine through the Middle Ages, women um, lost more and more ground in equal rights, I read. The medieval church considered women dangerous temptresses, <laughs> sorry, to be avoided by any pious man stained by the original sin of duplicitous Eve. Sorry, I am being serious. <clears throat> and even their association with the Virgin Mary could not fully redeem their nature. Wow. Sorry. The most probable cause for the exclusion of women of great merit from, from the history of the church is simply that they did not fit the church's um, narrative of devout and pious men um, as opposed to sinful and uh, tempting women. And when faced with the choice of changing the narrative, i.e. going against the hierarchy, or changing history, um, basically the, the relaying of that history was uh, quietly shoved to one side. Right hand.